Welcome back to the channel guys, Cliff here with The Sunday Drive. In today's video, we're gonna be going through every issue that most likely will happen to your 2014 to 2018 Silverado, uh, Sierra, Tahoe, and Suburban as well. A lot of these issues will go across all those product ranges since they are all still the same base vehicle. So definitely stay tuned for today's video. All right guys, so this is gonna be part one of at least a two-part series, uh, depending on how many issues you guys leave down in the comments, it could extend out to more. Um, but in today's video, we're gonna be going over 12 common issues, common issues with the Chevy Silverado as well as its sister models from GM. Um, now, like I said, this is not all of the issues, but the issues in this video are ones that I've experienced, at least I've experienced most of them with this truck. Um, so we're not only gonna go over those issues, but how to fix them or prevent them from happening altogether. So down in the descriptions, we'll have links to videos um, either from our channel or other channels that show you how to prevent um, or correct the issues if they have occurred. Um, and in the future, some of the issues that we haven't went over yet with this truck, we'll, we will make individual videos on those specific issues. But like I said, this will be part one. We'll be going through all the issues, 12 issues today. Leave any issues that you have experienced with your Silverado, Sierra, Tahoe, whatever, down in the comments. I'll go through those and whatever issues seem to be the most prevalent or most common that you guys are experiencing, I will put into a following vi video and go through those. But without any further ado, let's go through the things that you can expect to go wrong or break on your Silverado. Now the first issue we're gonna go through is inside this box. So let's get this opened up. And that is a torque converter. So um, if, you're, if your vehicle came equipped with the 6L80 transmission, the torque converter has an abnormally high failure rate. The failure rate on these is pretty incredible. Um, from being in a lot of the Facebook groups and forums, it seems like a lot of guys are experiencing failures with these as early as 70, 80,000 miles. And many are experiencing it before 120,000 miles. So um, while super early failure isn't too common, a lot of guys are having failure before 120,000 miles. So if you're towing a lot, um, and depending on how you're using the truck, it will probably wear this out faster. Unfortunately, while the 6L80 transmission seems to be a pretty good transmission overall, it doesn't have a lot of issues that the 8L90 transmission has, which I will get into next. The torque converters are extremely prone to failure. So I went ahead when I was doing the DOD delete and swapped mine out for a 6L90 torque converter. Um, it does work, no issues with it at all, direct bolt on. Um, however, those may still experience the same issues. Not 100% sure, so most likely when I'm around a 200, 220,000 miles, I'm probably gonna swap out for a billet one, um, but you might wanna save yourself four or $5,000 and proactively swap this out, especially if you're doing a lot of towing, either go to a billet one, or you could try out the slightly stronger 6L90 torque converter. Um, to hopefully solve the problem. A transmission rebuild or replacement can be anywhere from four to $6,000 or so. So it's a lot of money, whereas swapping one of these out is just a few hundred bucks, especially if you can do it yourself. Rebuilding a transmission is not something I'm comfortable doing myself, so I'm hopefully gonna keep my transmission around for quite a while. Um, now, the reason that these may be failing is because of how hot the transmissions are getting. So GM actually just re released the TSB recently, which we're gonna make a video on. Once that's done, I'll link it above. Um, and basically, the TSB helps your transmission drop temperature. So um, I think it's changing a bypass uh, valve or something like that to help the uh, fluid flow better so that you're getting cooler temperatures in there. Um, and a lot of guys are saying that's dropping their temps from 30 to 40 degrees. Um, so that is definitely gonna prolong the tr uh, life of your transmission as well as the torque converter heat kills transmissions, so the cooler you can keep your transmission, you do want it a little warm, but the cooler you can keep it, the better. Um, and part of the reason it might be heating up a lot is because of the exhaust running right across the belly pan. If you've watched our video where we did the transmission fluid change on this, that exhaust is right in your way, and I'm sure that it's not helping your transmission temperatures. So that is definitely an issue to be aware of. Um, if you're gonna be keeping your truck for a while, I would definitely suggest proactively changing this out somewhere between 80 and 120,000 miles when a lot of the failures that I'm seeing are occurring. Now, while we're on the topic of transmission, transmissions, as I hinted earlier, let's talk about the successor to the 6L80 transmission, the 8L90. So that is the eight-speed transmission that GM introduced, I believe, in 2016. So it uh, is in some of the newer Silverados and sister trucks of the Silverado. 
Um, and the issue that that transmission has is a lot of uh, shuddering. Um, so uh, basically you'd experience a little bit of shake in the vehicle from the transmission. I haven't personally experienced it because I don't have any vehicles equipped with that transmission. Um, the GM fix for that is doing a fluid flush um, and sometimes that fixes the issue and sometimes it doesn't. Um, what I've seen a lot of the guys on the forums recommend is doing a fluid uh, change yourself, going to a better quality transmission fluid like AMSOIL. Um, even AMSOIL in the 6L80, a lot of the guys said that helps with a lot of the harsh shifting. Now truck transmissions, you kind of expect a little bit of a harsh shift. With towing and stuff, they're gonna shift a little bit differently than like a sports car. Um, but a higher quality fluid in your transmission is always a good idea. So if you do have an 8L90, um, or a 6L80 or any transmission. I definitely recommend a high quality transmission fluid. I personally use AMSOIL. I've had a lot of success with it. Um, I really like how the truck drives with it. Um, so I would definitely recommend that or a similar, similar quality uh, transmission fluid. And the next common problem with the Silverados, at least if you uh, plan to do any performance upgrades, um, or like driving above the speed limit, is the drive shaft. So this is the stock drive shaft that we recently replaced and upgraded on my truck. And this causes two of the issues that we're gonna talk about. Um, potentially causes the first one, not 100% sure. Um, but the first issue we'll get into is the Chevy Shake. So um, it's a well-known fact that a lot of Chevy and GM vehicles, at least their trucks, shake at high speeds. Sometimes at very specific RPM ranges. And what a lot of guys believe is that it's because of the one, the very long one piece drive shaft. Um, so at certain frequencies, these can resonate and cause the truck to shake. At least that's what the theory is. Haven't tested it out, um, but um, that might be a problem. So Chevy shake is definitely an issue with these trucks. I have upgraded my drive shaft to a thicker one piece drive shaft, and I definitely still have some shaking issues. So. Um, potentially a two-piece drive shaft could help correct that. I haven't tried that out. Um, but if you have upgraded to a two-piece drive shaft and it's fixed your Chevy Shake, uh, definitely let us know down in the comments. The next issue with the drive shaft is its speed limit. So uh, from the factory, a lot of the Silverados, not all of them, some of the models aren't limited, um, but a lot of the Silverados are limited to 95 miles an hour. And the reason for that is because of this long drive shaft um, it's pretty thin. I don't know if you can hear how tinny that sounds, but it's a very thin drive shaft, especially at the ends where it tapers down. Um, and if you exceed 95 miles an hour, um, you might get lucky and be able to do it a few times. Maybe you get lucky and do it a lot of times, but eventually this drive shaft is going to split apart in the middle. Um, a lot of videos of these splitting apart on dynos, uh, at least it's documented that it's happened a lot of times. Most dyno shops won't even dyno Silverados if the drive shaft hasn't been upgraded because they're worried about the drive shafts exploding. So I went ahead, ahead and upgraded to a much thicker drive shaft. Same design, one piece, but it's the same thickness all the way through and the sidewalls are way thicker than this one. So if you wanna be able to dyno your truck in fourth gear, which was the main reason for me changing it up, you will wanna make sure that you upgrade your drive shaft, preferably to a two piece if you can, um, but a thicker one piece should work as well. Now one last thing I wanna mention on the drive shaft uh, before we go on to the next issue with the truck is that the company that we got it for, uh, from has not actually speed tested this above 95 miles an hour. It's made for high horsepower builds. Um, so don't take my word that it couldn't still fail. Um, they, do, they did say they do plan to speed test it because they've had a lot of questions about that, but they also sell a two piece drive shaft for a lot of the Silverado models. Um, which might be a safer option if you do plan to like race your truck or something like that. They're gonna have it at high speeds often. Now, while we're on the topic of the drivetrain, let's talk about the power plant, the engine. So a lot of you guys are probably subscribed to this channel because of the DOD, Displacement On Demand, or AFM Active Fuel Management series that we did on my truck. Um, and that is honestly probably the biggest issue with these Silverados and a lot of the GM vehicles in general. Um, so if you guys aren't familiar with it, GM has a uh, technology where some of the lifters can collapse. In my specific engine, the L83, which is also similar to the 6.2 L86, mine's the 5.3, um, four of the cylinders can deactivate 
um, so that you save fuel economy when you're basically at low speeds or cruising on the highway. It'll turn four of those cylinders off. While this sounds awesome, and I wish it worked flawlessly because extra fuel economy is always nice, especially with gas prices right now. Unfortunately, those lifters, because of their design, are prone to failure, um, which can, uh, at worst, make some weird noises, or at, I guess at the least, can make some weird noises come from your engine, and at the worst, can actually destroy your motor. Um, you know, bending valves, it can uh, damage the camshaft, a lot of other things, and then you have metal flying around, and you, that's never a good idea <laughs> to have metal flying around a motor where everything's finely lubricated. Um, so, um, GM has had a lot of issues with this motor. Now, this generation, the L83, L86, does have a lot less issues than the previous AFM systems. I believe GM introduced this sometime between 2006, 2008, um, and those early systems had tons and tons of problems. It was similar design, similar concept, but they seem to get it better with this. Um, unfortunately, um, it still does fail a lot, so if you plan to keep your truck for a long time, especially past the warranty period, I definitely recommend doing a DOD delete, whether you do it yourself or hire a shop to do it. If you're keeping the truck within warranty, don't worry about it, just GM will have to fix it if it fails. But once you're out of that warranty period, if you want it to keep going for a while, definitely recommend doing that upgrade. Um, now, unfortunately, GM kept this technology around um, for the next generation of trucks, and they seem to be even having more issues. A lot of motors are failing uh, within the first 10,000 miles because of faulty lifters. And GM actually just released a uh, bulletin or DS TSP or, or recall, I'm not really sure uh, the technical term, I need to look into it a little more, but they're instructing dealerships to go in and I, it's either the lifters or valves to replace those before they even sell the vehicle to uh, a customer. So I'm guessing they had some sort of bad batch and they've just woken up to that. And so they're shipping the trucks to dealers and then they actually have to take the motor apart, replace components before they'll even sell it to customers. So um, hopefully they get that issue fixed in the 22, 23 model years. But if you do have a 2019, 2020, a lot of those trucks having problems. So if you like your Silverado or your Tahoe, Sierra, whatever it is, definitely recommend doing a DOD active fuel management delete on the truck. Now the most common comment that we get on our DOD active fuel management series is can I just do this with a range technology or tune it out with HP tuners um, and won't that prevent the, those lifters from activating so that they, they don't fail? Um, it helps. It definitely helps if the lifters aren't um, actuating and changing so that the cylinders are deactivating. Um, one would think that that would extend the life um, before I did the series on the truck, I put a poll out on Facebook though. Um, you always have to question polls. And I said, hey, for anyone that tuned this out, like right after they bought the truck, you know, you got the truck in the first 10,000 miles, you threw a range on there, you tuned it out with HP tuners. Have you still seen lifters fail? Um, and within a few hours, two guys commented that they, as soon as they got the truck, they put range technology on and before 100,000 miles, they still had lifters fail. So can it help? Sure, it doesn't hurt. It also helps the truck drive a lot better. It's a lot nicer because the, the shift between four cylinders and eight cylinders can be kind of jerky. Um, but it doesn't prevent the failure from happening, unfortunately. I wish it did. It would be great if you could just plug an OBD module in there and you're good to go. But unfortunately, that is not the case. Now, before we move on to some of the interior issues that this truck has, let's finish up with the exterior of the vehicle. Um, so one of the exterior issues, especially with white Silverados, is the paint quality. Um, now, I haven't experienced this issue myself, but a lot of the guys with the 14 and 15 model year Silverados, um, I'm not sure about later generations, have, but have a lot of issues with the paint control quality, and it seems to be especially prevalent with the white Silverados. Um, basically, you'll get large chunks of the paint that just flake off the vehicle. No collision or accident. Um, it could be a rock chip maybe causing it, but a lot of times you'll have, um, like especially on your pillars, um, and I've seen on the fenders, and around the, the doors and windows where just sections of the paint are just flaking off of the vehicle. So I'm not really sure what to do to prevent that. Obviously putting a good coat of wax to help protect your vehicle never hurts. Um, I've waxed this truck um, usually twice a year, depending on how busy I am, but at least once a year. And I haven't had any of those flaking issues at all anywhere on the vehicle. So that may help. Um, and this is a 14. So the first year of this model where it seemed to have a lot of those paint issues. Um, so, you know, you could also put a clear bra or something like that on the front of the vehicle to maybe help prevent rock chips from flaking some of the paint away, but just something to be aware of um, if you have a early generation Silverado. 
And then moving along to the back of the vehicle, um, we did a video series where we coated the frame on the truck. And the issue with the frame coating from the factory um, is it's a wax coating. And while it's there, it's really good. It's soft, it'll absorb rock chips um, and protect the paint or protect the frame underneath. Unfortunately, over time, that wax coating hardens and just flakes off of the vehicle. Um, so if you can catch it early, um, it's a good idea to either strip that down and do a full new coating. Um, we recoated the at least the back half of the truck. I still have the whole front half to do, which kind of bothers me and keeps me up at night sometimes. But we did do the back half. Um, the other solution is spraying it down with some oil-based uh, lubricant. Now, even though I stripped the frame and coated it with POR, anything you paint on a frame can get chipped. It can dry and crack over time. Um, POR is definitely it is an issue that can happen with POR over time. So no matter what you do to your frame, the best protection is going to be spraying it down yearly. When we're actually done filming this video, I'm getting ready to pull the truck on the lift and spray it down underneath with some fluid film. Um, now, if you can catch the truck before it starts rusting within the first or two years of ownership on the frame, and you can just spray it with fluid film every uh, winter, and if you're in a really bad area, maybe twice in the winter, um, that should save your frame, your doors, you know, just coat everything underneath. Now, the downside of this is it is gonna be very messy um, when you go to work on your truck, but I'd rather have a little bit of mess under there and know that my frame is not rusting away. Um, if you don't do that, um, we're working on Pete's 2004 Silverado over here. So nothing to this frame has ever been done. And most of the frame looks pretty good. These rails are in really good shape overall. We've already sanded and uh, take the grinder to these and, and they've cleaned up pretty well. They're in pretty good shape. Unfortunately, uh, there is still rust. That, so that's why we're gonna be coating it and fixing it. But around the fuel tank here, is really bad and you can see we have new cross braces we're gonna have to be welding in but I can stick my hand all the way through um, this brace here where's the hole oh up here yeah there's two big holes my hand is all the way through this cross brace there's a big hole right here um, there's also a hole in the front cross brace and the reason that these are worse than the other uh, braces is because your fuel tank sits right here now if you watched uh, the coating video I did on my truck, I didn't drop the fuel tank. I was lazy, I did everything else, but I left the fuel tank up because I was stupid. Now the reason these rust out so bad is that the fuel tank sits up and wraps around both of these rails, and this is completely hidden. Without dropping the tank, there is no way to see this damage in there. So um, even if you're coating your truck with oil, I would strongly, strongly recommend um, dropping the fuel tank occasionally. Um, with the bed removed, it is super easy. And if you watch our video, removing the bed is not hard at all if you have a few buddies to help you lift it off. And then dropping the fuel tank is not hard either. Um, I would definitely recommend doing that, even if you're coating with oil, because it's gonna be very hard to get oil down under here to protect that. And you really are gonna wanna get under there, wire brush it, repaint it, um, probably every four or five years if you live in an area that's really prone to salt, because it doesn't take long to eat through metal if there's salt sitting on it. Moving on to the interior of the truck, there are a few things um, that will go wrong. So I'll start off with a really easy basic one, our dash rattles. So we have a video on this, but there are a lot of screws, especially under here, um, that get loose over time and you'll have a very annoying rattle. I'll link to the video in the description, as I said, with a lot of these uh, problems, we have videos on them. Uh, so if you pull this panel down, you can tighten up those screws. Um, and that has completely taken the rattle away from me for several years. I've just started to hear a rattle again down in here, so I think one of those screws came loose again, but it's lasted for several years, at, you know, 30, 40,000 miles since I did it. So it's not something you're gonna have to do every day, but once in a while, you may have to tighten those up. Now, other guys have said they have had issues with rattles up in the dash area. I haven't had any of those rattles, um, but they said there are some screws in the dash that also can get loose. Um, so I'm sure if you do a little research, there's probably guys that have shown how to fix that. Um, another issue with things becoming loose, potentially, are grounding issues. So um, this truck has several grounds that apparently um, uh, become faulty over time. Um, so one of those is up near this front left speaker. There's a guy's video that's pretty good. I'll try to find that and link it down in the description. Uh, some of the sound deadening can kind of get in between the grounding strap and the frame. 
um, or at least the, the exposed metal that it's grounding to and uh, prevent that ground from working so you can get some weird issues from that. Um, when I first had the truck, I actually had, within the first year or two, so it was still under warranty, um, the truck was randomly shutting off on me. Um, and I had checked the battery terminals, those were all tight. Um, it didn't happen often, but it was kind of terrifying when it did because the truck would just instantly die. Um, all the electric in the truck, everything would turn off. Um, so I took it to the dealer, um, and they di did say there was a loose ground that they tightened up. I don't know which ground that was, uh, but that could be one of the other ones that has issues. I think there's like three or four different grounds on the truck that have problems. Again, I haven't really experienced or fixed any of these issues personally, except that one time through the dealer. Um, but there's a lot of good resources online to figure out where those are if you are having grounding issue. Now, another thing that people don't like is water. So at least when water is inside of their vehicle. Um, now we have a video showing how to do this, but the roof antenna right up here, as well as the third brake light at the back of the vehicle are very, very, very prone to leaking over time. Um, the problem, at least with the third brake light, is they use an extremely thin gasket. And as it dries out and ages, um, water is able to protrude through that through, uh, third brake light. And um, while not catastrophic to the vehicle, it's a very good chance it's gonna wreck your headliner, which is very hard to change, replace, and clean. So if you can prevent that from happening by either popping it off um, and putting a thicker gasket in there, which we linked to in the video on that third brake light, or you can just silicone around it. So what I chose to do was I took the third brake light off, and my solution might have been more of a permanent one, um, but I siliconed inside the brake light where a gasket would normally be, stuck it on there, and then I siliconed outside of the brake light. Um, and I was able to do that because I'm running a headache rack that actually completely blocks my third brake light anyway. It has built-in lights. Um, I really like this headache rack too. We'll have a link to this or a link to the video where we install it. Um, but I didn't care about my third brake light. So if you're running a headache rack or something that, doesn't, uh, that blocks that, you could do the solution I did where you just completely silicone around it. It'll prevent the issue from happening, um, but it might be a bit of a pain if you ever want to reverse it. Um, for the front one, I just did a little silicone around it. Actually accessing it, you kind of have to drop the headliner in here, get up there. There's a bolt on the inside or a nut on the inside you have to release to remove that uh, brake light. Now, I didn't silicone around the whole thing because as you see the, the, the trunk is, or the hood is, the roof <laughs> is uh, slanted forward. I mean, there's a little hole at the back. So I just siliconed the back because to me, where most of the water would be coming in is from the back. It's not going to kind of run down the sides and get in. That's just going to kind of go away. Um, but I haven't had any leaks after doing I never had any leaks regardless, but I haven't had any leaks since doing that either. And this is a 14. We're in almost 2022, so seven, eight-year-old truck uh, without that issue happening. So that fix definitely works, at least for a while. You might have to redo it at some point. Now, while we're back here at the third brake light, let's talk about the rear window of the truck. So um, unfortunately, these can explode. Um, it hasn't happened on mine, but if you do use your remote start uh, in the winter or you turn on your rear defroster in the winter, um, a short can occur inside, I believe, in the glass itself. Um, so I think some of the elements are getting messed up. Could be wrong the exact reason, but a short does occur and these rear windows can explode, unfortunately. So the simple solution to that is one, don't remote start your truck, uh, and two, don't turn on the rear defrost when you get in. Um, unfortunately, that's not really an ideal solution, especially if you live somewhere cold and you need to warm the truck up ahead of time. Um, so what a lot of guys do is they actually just unplug the connection to this back window. Um, I believe the connection is right behind the back seat, but I'm gonna make a detailed video showing how to unplug that connection. Um, and that will be linked down in the description. So I won't get into that too much right yet because I haven't done it, but that is something to be aware of. There are some guides online you can look up if you wanna do it before I get the video out. Um, but just be aware of that. Try not to use the rear defroster too much. Now, with that said, my truck is almost eight years old. Hasn't happened to me. Um, but I also don't use the rear defroster that much. It's only really cold here for two, three months of the year, thankfully, um, down in Jersey. Um, but if you're up in a more colder climate where you're using this a lot, um, that may cause this issue to occur earlier. Speaking of the cold, you want your AC to be cold in the summertime. And unfortunately, the condensers on these trucks suck <laughs> and they break all the time. This is a failure that I've experienced with mine. So we have a detailed uh, replacement guide for the condenser up on the channel. It's really easy. Definitely a job you can do on your own with minimal tools and experience. It's not hard at all. 
Um, you'll just need a shop to recharge it for you. But a quick way to tell if your condenser has been replaced, now the replacements can still fail. Mine hasn't yet, thankfully, but they can still fail. If you look down, I don't know how well this is gonna show up, but uh, can you see the silver right there? Yeah. Um, so that silver, like little square in the top right corner, actually will let you know that your condenser has been replaced at some point. So if that's there, it has the upgraded condenser. Now, I don't know if they all come with this. I asked the dealer when I picked this part up, why is there this little like silver thing? And they said, that way they can tell if it's been replaced. <laughs> so um, at least on mine, that's what happened. It's fixed now, there's a video up, but the condensers on these do and almost will fail. I have a buddy with a 2016, his has failed already. They have some weak welds. Rock chips can also hit them, mess them up, but that's a failure that probably will happen if it hasn't already. So those are the biggest issues and likely failures that you'll experience on your Silverado, Sierra, Tahoe, Suburban, whatever, GM model from around 2014 to 2018. Some of the model years vary a little bit depending on the vehicle, but did we forget anything? I'm sure we did. So let us know down in the comments what things you've had go wrong on your vehicle or issues that you've heard about other people having, and we will be making a part two to this series and we'll go through all of those. So thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate all of you. We wouldn't be here without you, so we appreciate it. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.